Moving on, a neuro question now. All the following are true about Weber syndrome, except the choices are ipsilateral third nerve palsy, diplopia, contralateral hemiplegia, and ipsilateral seventh nerve palsy. So, one way of uh, attempting those questions, you know, approaching those questions is look at which part gets affected and therefore what would be the uh, corresponding deficits. Uh, that is one way of doing it. I have tried to simplify it for you. Born cat not skeptical, cat is not born with cerebral palsy. So, here B is Benedict syndrome, please write that down. Rn is the red nucleus, that is what gets affected in ben Benedict syndrome and this patient will have chorea, athetosis and tremor. That is Benedict syndrome. Not is North Nagel syndrome. And SCP is the superior cerebellar peduncle, not cerebral, superior cerebellar peduncle. Uh, CA is cerebellar ataxia. Right? This is Claude's syndrome. Claude syndrome is a combination of North Nagel and Benedict syndromes, right? So, all those features. W is uh, Weber syndrome, the cerebral peduncle gets affected and there is a contralateral hemiplegia, right? In all these patients, there will be an ipsilateral third nerve palsy. So, third nerve palsy syndromes with contralateral features with the structures that get affected, okay? Simplifies things for you. Going back to the question, they will have an ipsilateral oculomotor nerve palsy. Why would they have diplopia? One side or extraocular muscle palsy definitely is going to cause diplopia in certain uh, gazes. Contralateral hemiplegia, Weber syndrome cerebral with cerebral palsy. Cerebral peduncle, contralateral hemiplegia, ipsilateral facial nerve palsy is not a feature of Weber's syndrome. So, while we are on the topic of smoking cessation, let us discuss variniclin. It is a relatively new drug. What do we want to do when we give a drug that will help the individual quit smoking, right? We want a drug that will produce similar effects to nicotine but at a slower potency, right? Not as potent as nicotine. So, that is what variniclin does. At the same time, what happens if the patient relapses, if he starts smoking again? So, then that drug should disallow nicotine from binding to its receptor. That is what a partial agonist does. Little bit of general pharmacology. What is a partial agonist? It produces partial effects of the full agonist and in the presence of the full agonist, a partial agonist behaves as a competitive antagonist, right? That is what variniclin is. Variniclin is a partial agonist. Your Harrison says it is a nicotinic acid receptor agonist antagonist, right? So, I have explained actually none of those is incorrect. Goodman Gilman says it is a partial agonist at the nicotinic alpha 4 beta 2 receptor, okay? While that is what Goodman Gilman says, while Harrison says it is a partial agonist antagonist, right? So, I do not think you will have to choose between the two in your exam. If you have to, good luck to you, both standard books, I would go with what Harrison says, right? You are not expected to read Goodman Gilman. But you should know that technically the correct answer is partial agonist. Next, we discuss tubercular effusions, the most common cause of an exudative effusion in our country, in most developing countries. 
uh, it's usually a part of primary TB. It does occur in secondary TB as well. Secondary TB, primary TB, primary TB is the tuberculosis that occurs usually in kids or in areas where the prevalence of tuberculosis is low like the west, right. Uh, so, it occurs right after infection. Secondary TB, they get infected, then they have a long latent phase and then many years uh, after the uh, infection, they get either it, the bacilli get reactivated or they get reinfected with tubercle bacilli, right, that is secondary TB. So, it is seen in those patients also, it is very common to see adults with uh, secondary TB and pleural effusions. But it is more commonly a part of primary tuberculosis. It is usually a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction which means there are no bacilli, whether you do a ZN stain and, uh, or a mean rhodamine stain or even if you do a culture, usually all those would be negative, right. Uh, it is an exudate, most tubercular fluids, whether it is pericardial, whether it is pleural, whether it is ascitic, whether it is uh, a patient with TB meningitis, all those TB uh, associated fluids, fluid collections are rich in protein. They are all again rich in lymphocytes. Uh, they have a high ADA. Adenosine deaminase is an enzyme meant for purine metabolism. It is usually elevated in patients with TB, but it is not specific for tuberculosis. It can also be elevated in a lot of paranemonic effusions and it can be elevated in some malignant pleural effusions, right. Those are the causes of raised ADA. You can get a question on that. All the following are causes of raised ADA in the pleural fluid except, right. Or you can get a PGI question which says, uh, which are the effusions in which the uh, ADA is elevated. Ah. So, this stain is negative, you do not see organisms in plural uh, fluid of, due to TB unless you have tubercular empyma. When you have tubercular pus in the plural space, it is teeming with tubercle bacilli, okay. So, that is TB effusions. Uh, this is what usually an effusion will look like. This is a very common uh, x-ray that you see in patients with tuberculosis and effusion, that is a hydro pneumothorax. No lung markings here, so this is a pneumothorax and you see an air fluid level, a flat air fluid level, right. So, when the, uh, when there is no air in the pleural space, the uh, pleural fluid is gradually rising up into the pleural space at the upper level. When there is air in the pleural space, so pleural space is become like now the pleural space is not a potential space anymore. Now the pleural space is behaving like a beaker, like a glass. So this fills uh, that space like uh, an ordinary container would, right? That's a smaller hydronemothorax. Your MCQ exam is all about uh, differential diagnosis, right? They give you a snapshot and they expect you to give a diagnosis, right? So, very quickly, what is the differential diagnosis of pancytopenia with macrocytosis? Now, that is pancytopenia hemoglobin of 9, TLC of 2500 and platelets of 80,000. The MCV of 104 tells us that this is macrocytic, okay. When with this picture, you have hypersegmented polymorphs and hypercellular marrow, you dealing with B12 deficiency. Okay. When with this picture of pancytopenia with macrocytosis, you have hyposegmented polymorphs, hypercellular marrow, dysplastic appearing pre precursors, you are dealing with myelodysplastic syndrome. These things are very important people, please note them down, you definitely get a question on this. Okay. And if you have fatty or hypocellular marrow, the marrow seems replaced with fat with normal appearing precursors, macrocytic pancytopenia. With this, then you are dealing with aplastic anemia. Very, very important. You will be expected to make that distinction. So, which is why let us quickly do that. Aplastic anemia is usually a disease of the young adult or the adolescent. The cells, as I just told you, in the bone marrow appear normal. Uh, the cytogenetic study will be normal. On the other hand, MDS is a disease of the elderly. The cells are dysplastic and the one diagnostic test for MDS is abnormal cytogenetics.
Moving on, approximately how many reactions in the human body depend upon the availability of B12? What do you think? Uh, deficiency causes anemia, indeed it can cause pancytopenia and uh, deficiency causes can cause paraparesis which is called subacute combined degeneration. How many reactions do you think uh, B12 takes care of? Two, only two reactions, right? One is the homocysteine to methionine conversion that we just discussed two slides back. The other is methyl malonyl CoA isomerization, which is why in B12 deficiency, these patients will develop methyl malonic acidemia and methyl malonic acidemia.